even those who right now still say we have the right to defend ourselves. Today, they were able to release one girl. Her father is a religious man. I saw the picture. They did yesterday a frashat chala in a house, and a few days ago they brought Sefer Torah into a room. They prayed a lot. Lots of people read Tehillim for this girl. And in the end, Baruch Hashem, by a miracle, this girl was released. This is very good news and also bad news. Why it's bad news? Good news we understand. But why bad news? Because that's a proof that these monsters, Arabs of the Hamas, divided the hostages in many different places. They're not in one place. If they were all in one place, if the army find a place, they can release all of them in one hour. But if one is here and one there, it's 220 people, each one of them is in a different apartment or different tunnel or different basement, good luck finding them. It may take years. I want to remind you that some of the Israeli hostages in the past never returned. Like the Israeli pilot Ron Arad was captured by uh, Lebanon. They g- gave him to Iran. Until today, nobody knows what happened to him. His wife got stuck at Guna. I heard that she lives together with this Rasha Merusha, Rafi Refesh, the lefty liberal garbage on the TV every day. The one that interview me, they hate the religion so much. Someone told me that they are a couple. There is no problem living with a married woman, Aguna. No problem. She is the miserable person in this whole story. Her husband was young, Israeli pilot, was captured by these Arabs. Who knows what they did to him? Maybe they tortured him so much until he died. Or maybe he never died. Maybe even today he's still alive in his 60s. I don't know, late 50s. Nobody knows what happened to him. And over the years, there are a few other people who got missing and nobody knows where they are. Let's hope it's not going to be the case with these 200 uh, hostages. No matter how it is, it's not going to end good. Why? Because if they are divided to many places, you won't be able to, re- to rescue all of them. It's uh, always a big danger that at one point the Hamas will be in such a terrible situation that they are about to be destroyed and Chas Shalom they can kill all of them. And if they will agree to release them, that means they're going to ask for 10,000 murderers to be released from Israeli jails. The Israeli stupid government already made that mistake with one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit. They released 1,027 murderers of the Hamas for one Israeli soldier. One. 1,027 horrible monster, like you, want, like you saw, they released for one soldier. I don't know who the fool who gave the okay for that. It's against the Torah. It's against common sense. It's against diplomacy. It's against politics. It's against everything. Who does such a stupid thing? I mean, it's horrible that you have a prisoner somewhere. Of course, it breaks the heart. But why would you release one Jew to cause hundreds or now thousands to die for that one Jew? Since when you replace a thousand Jews for the life of one? It's against the Torah. The Torah says even one for one you're not allowed to replace. If the Goim say we have Itzik, give us Avi, we release Itzik. One for one you're not allowed to give them Avi. Needless to say, 1,027 mass murderers that all they want is to kill Jews. That's their dream. And obviously, they're going to kill as many as they can. As you just saw, they participated in what happened now. But the worst one is that the head of the Hamas, not those who sit in Qatar and Dubai, the head of the Hamas in Gaza, Imach Shimov Sinwar, was released for that Gilad Shalit. 
1,400 Jews died for that stupid deal. He is the one who orchestrated this whole operation. He is the one. So one of the, of the, of the 1,027 that they released, look what he did to us. Imagine what the others do and what they will do. So for, for one, they got over a thousand. For 200, they would want all the prisoners. They won't agree for less than 10,000 murderers. I hope Netanyahu is not going to be stupid like he was before, or the rest of these, these fools. With all the pain, you have to, as a leader, you have to think, how do I minimize the casualty of my nation? I, my heart goes for every Jew, for every person, for the non-Jews that are in prison, for everyone. But as a leader, I have to use my head. I can't go by the heart. I must use the head. Doing this to cause them 10,000 10, times bigger damage, that's stupidity. That's, that's weakness. I want to tell you one, one other thing. You see, in the end, hopefully one day you'll understand it. Everything I've been saying for almost 30 years, that every one of our tragedies from day one until today, we did 100% to ourselves. We blame now the Hamas, we blame the Israeli government, we blame everyone. But in the end, we actually destroyed ourselves. What is, what's the point? The Israeli fools, the lefty liberals, they love to have mercy on mass murderers with no heart. And they would like to be very cruel to Bachure Yeshiva, to religious people, to people that are not lefty. As far as they're concerned, they can all drop dead. But they are very, very sensitive for some Palestinian Nazi who, according to him, all Jews should die immediately. And if he had a button to do it, he will do it with no hesitation. And just make no mistake, the two million Palestinians that live in Gaza, not even 1% of them agree for the Jews to stay alive. Not 1%. For every... Hundreds that you get in Gaza, you won't find one that likes Jews to stay alive. That's the situation. No exaggeration here. From thousand, from thousand, thousand Gaza civilians, you won't find ten that agree that Jews will remain alive. So there's no innocent people there. It's baloney. Don't let them sell you that nonsense. Every time they kill a Jew, they all dance on the street. You see. Everyone comes out, dancing, party, music, giving candies. And they voted for the Hamas. The Hamas got 65% in the election in Gaza. Where are the other 35% went? Some didn't vote. But they also pro-Hamas. They're just lazy. They didn't go to vote. And some vote for Abu Mazen, which is just as bad. He also wants all of us to die. So in the end, they don't have one leader normal that comes say, let's live with the Jews in peace. Vote for me. I'm going to make peace with the Jews. There's no such thing by them. You don't have one lefty by the Arabs. There's no such thing. Every one of them hates us. If you find one out of a thousand, it will be a very pleasant surprise. So the world is a hypocrite. But do you think they don't know it? Of course they know it. But they hate us more than they hate them. That's it. They hate them and they hate us. And they think, who do we hate more? They hate the Jews more. But there's another reason for it. Business. It's all money. The world is taking the Palestinian side not to get the Arab countries angry. Why? Because the Arabs are close to 2 billion people and the Jews are only 15 million people. Even though most of them successful financially, but they're only 15 million. Take the kids, take the very old people. How many you have? Five million that can buy something? In a Muslim world, you have close to two billion customers. Companies like Coca-Cola, like the airlines, why should they take the side of Israel? The Arabs are going to put them in a band. They lose trillions of dollars. They don't want to jeopardize themselves. All the... British soccer leagues, soccer teams, none of them wanted to do memorial for the 1,400 Jews who were murdered. Why? All the soccer teams is owned by Arab sheikhs. 
they got an order from the Arabs in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, make, don't do anything for the Jews. We are happy that they died. I own the team. If you're going to do something for the Jews, I will, you know, I'm the boss. You must do what I say. That's it. So the British hypocrite, they had to, you know, ignore it. Then they killed two Swedish people. Some Arab terrorists shot two Swedish people. All the games had memorial for the two Swedish, but nothing for the 1,400 Jews. Why? Arab, Arab won the league. They buy everything. They have, they have, Hashem gave the Ishmael, we're going to talk about it. How do you see everything that I'm talking about now in, in the parasha we read two days ago? It's all in the parasha. So what happened? Then, then everyone is afraid to mess with them. One is that they are big buying power. Two, they are terrorists. They bully every city that they live in. The mayor is shaking from them. The police is shaking from them. The army is shaking from them. The country is in, petrified from them. Like, look what they did in France. How many times they went and burned thousands of, of cars just because they told them that they have to remove the burqa. When they take picture for driver's license, they have to remove that. They can see their face. They refused. They told them it's a new law. No more burqa is allowed in France. Tens of thousands of cars were burned in one day. They burned France. There's five million of them. Terrorists. Algerians, Moroccans, Tunisians, terrorists, Al-Qaeda people, ISIS people. They flood Europe with 50 million of them almost, all over the countries. There's nothing you can do. Europe is destroyed. United States is also a big problem. Over here, you also have millions. Not in the same ratio like Europe, but the Democrat fools, especially Hussein Obama, flooded New York, Michigan, Chicago, some parts of California, flooded them with refugees from Syria. All the people that the Arab governments wanted to get rid of came to here, and to Germany, and to England, and to France, and to Denmark, and to Sweden, Greece, flooded all these areas. And every place they come, they complain, they don't like the authorities, they want to make their own rules, and everyone around becomes their enemy, no matter how much you help them. The Germans help them put billions of dollars to give them a place to live, to give them all kinds of benefits, and they scream in the face of the Germans, make no mistake, as soon as we'll be able to be independent, we have to slaughter all Germans. In their face. This is their number one trait, ungratefulness. It's in the parasha, Agar, their mother. Ungratefulness. This, everything you see today in a massive amount all started in a parasha, Lech Lecha. And the next parasha is away. You see it right here in the Torah. Everything that you see today in the world, it's all written in a few pages in the Torah. Just, it developed to such massive uh, measurements, unfortunately. So what happened? So now the hostages are all in different places. Who knows what's going to be with them? Hashem Irachem, who knows what they did, what they still continue to do to the girls? Who knows? And we didn't even finish 10% of the job now. Who's to say that we'll be able to survive? Do you know Israel? Economy was relatively successful until the war started. It started to go down when there was a disagreement between the left and the right for one year, demonstrations all over Israel, lack of unity. The economy started to, high-tech started to collapse. The interest rate went up. Real estate started to go down. Retails did bad. And now we got the crash. What's the crash? Since before Sukkot, nobody works. Everyone is in reserve. 100,000 households, uh, heads of households, you know, like uh, they are in a, in a reserve, in the army. They don't work. Companies don't have employees. No one is in the office. Doctors are not there. Lawyers are not working. The court working maybe 10% capacity. Not, nothing. It's, it's terrible what's happening. 
One month like this, you don't make an income. Financially, you're starting to go down. The country doesn't get taxes. Plus, every missile we shoot, for the rockets that they shoot, every rocket costs the Hamas $200 to make. We have to shoot a missile to shut it down. It costs us $100,000, every missile. And they shoot at us close to 2,000 rockets a day in some days. Some more, some less, but 1,500. So at least 80% of the rockets, we have to shoot them down. So imagine now, we have 1,000 rockets. Each rocket, each missile we shoot costs us $100,000. Millions of dollars we lose every hour. Millions of dollars. Israel is not such a rich country. Somebody has to pay billions. This war would cost more than $10 billion already, as it is. Not to talk about the damage to the economy. Not to talk about the mental damage that every family now in Israel has. And children, they will be terrified for the rest of their life. What do you think? It's going away. Children grow with bombs and sirens every day, going in and out to the shelter, no school. It's a disaster. Look how much we are paying for not agreeing to follow Hashem's instruction. For everything that happens to us is written in Parashat Bechukotai and Parashat Kitavo. 147 curses, follow them one by one. Every one of them happened to us in the last month. Every one of them. Check. Exactly word by word what Hashem threatened us, that if we go against Him, that's going to be our end, with the enemies that live inside us and the enemies around us. And it's all happening. And as we speak, there are demonstrations of the lefty liberals now for the Hamas inside Tel Aviv. After what they saw, they still demonstrate for them with Palestinian flags. This is the Erev Rav that lives inside us, who cooperate with them. For sure, it's an inside job, for sure. Don't be foolish that all of a sudden they broke in 15 different places in the fence and nobody showed up for eight hours. No intelligence, no radars, no police showed showed up, no army showed up, not, nobody came, no air force. It takes three minutes for an helicopter to come from a base into the border. Three minutes. I was in the air force. F-16 in one minute is up. From the minute there is a siren, in one minute the F-16 is already up, ready to, to shoot anyone. An helicopter is faster. Right away. Nobody showed up. No helicopters, no F-16, nothing has to be an inside job. These lefty liberals are the big enemy. I, I've been saying it for more than 20 years. Ah, you're exaggerating. Unfortunately, everything I said was true. Everything. Unfortunately, I wish I was wrong in everything. Now people say, wow, you say this, you say that. Every day people send me parts of lectures from five years ago, ten years ago, two years ago. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. It's not prophecy. It's simple common sense. It was obvious. The Gemara said, Chacham enough berosho. All you need is a little bit of wisdom to see where the process will end. <laughs> if your enemy accumulate thousands of missiles every month, who are they doing it for? To shoot at the moon? For fireworks? For Fourth and July fireworks? For what are they collecting Hezbollah 250,000 missiles? What is this? What are they getting so much ammunition from Iran? Why Iran is so desperate to get the nuclear bomb? For whom? Everything that you see in the world is all for us. And everything that happens is Hashem doing to us. He's using these monsters. He's using this Ishmael to torture us. It's written already in the Gemara, in the Zohar. The name of these Arabs is Ishmael because because of them we will scream so loud to Hashem that Hashem in the end will hear our our, it's like it's written in Yetziat Mitzrayim, Vatal Shav'atam El HaShamayim. Shav'atenu Kabel, Ushmat Filatenu. Shav'a means like screaming with, from the, from the bottom of the heart. 
There is one thing even higher than that. It's called an anaka, ankatam, meaning it's not just screaming from the heart, it's screaming with the highest level of pain. Once Hashem, you know, accept our screaming and all that, and the Tehilim, and all the Torah, and the Tshuva, the main thing is the Tshuva, because if we read Tehilim forever, but we're not going to change for the better, it's not going to help that much. Because it's written in a book of Yonah, that Hashem, Yonah warned the Goim, that in 40 days Hashem will wipe them out. And the Goim fasted, and they put sack on their head. They wore sack, they put the ashes on their head. And uh, they even made the animals and the children also fast. That's how much they did tshuva the goyim. And then the decree was cancelled. They were supposed to, all of them supposed to die. Who knows how many hundreds of thousands of, of people from Nineveh. Nineveh is close to Syria. So in the end, none of them died. Why? They did tshuva. But what's written in the book of Yonah, we read it in Yom Kippur in... Uh, in Maftir Yonah, what do we read? Vayar Hashem, Hashem saw that they changed their behavior. Not that they fast, not that they scream, not that they wore a sack. All of that is important, of course, it's a part of repenting. But the main thing in repentance is you were a low life and now you have to be a holy person. You were wicked, now you have to be righteous. You were a thief, you stop stealing and you return what you stole. You mechalel Shabbat, you stop being mechalel Shabbat. Baruch Hashem, like I always said, in the hospitals and in the army, in a war, everyone is religious. You see all the soldiers, I'm sure you got a lot of those videos, how everyone scream, Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, Hashem Hu Elokim, Shema Yisrael, Anachnu Ma'aminim, Bnei Ma'aminim. I want to refresh your memory that half of these soldiers voted for the left. Half of Israel, it's lefties. You see now 100,000 soldiers, reserve, lawyers, doctors, engineers, university people, teachers. They're all now fighting, re getting ready to go into Gaza. All the soldiers together, almost all of them put tzitzit, and they all sing religious songs. Where were you six months ago when you wanted to burn the Torah? If you were singing religious songs six months ago, we wouldn't be where we are right now. Better later never. Better later never. This Merav Michael Imach Shima, one of the Bernie Sanders in a female version, she said today, it's a horrible, sad day for the left in Israel. When I see so many soldiers put tzitzit, it breaks my heart. It means we have no future in this country. <laughs> it kills her to see chayalim putting tzitzit and say, Shema Yisrael. It kills her. It kills her. She's suffering. She's probably sitting home and taking drugs to ease the pain. Do you understand who, will, who live among us? We worry about the monsters of the Hamas. There's anything to expect from these monsters. It's the one who gives them the power to succeed. These lefty liberals. Don't ever forget who brought it on us. True that it's also our fault. Because if we were all righteous, all the people that works with kippah and tzitzit, if we were 100% righteous, then we have two, two and a half million shomrei mitzvot. For two and a half million Shomer Mitzvot, Hashem would not bring such a tragedy. The fact that it happened and we all are heartbroken, that means every one of us is guilty. Some more, some less, but everyone is guilty. Why? Because if you know what it means, two and a half million tzaddikim? Two and a half million tzaddikim is close to 20% of the Jewish nation. For 20% tzaddikim, Hashem would bring such a tragedy? No. Apparently, we're not as tzaddikim as we thought. And everyone is trying to find the easy way out. The easy way out. There's no easy way out and there's no shortcuts. Enough with these babasali dreams. Enough with all these illusions. Enough with all this. And it's about time you grow up. Rabbi, is it true? The babasali did this. He, saw, he, he dreamed that. He dreamed that. He dreamed this. Enough of these dreams. The Torah is not dreams of all kinds of Mechalele Shabbat. 
that had a dream, all of us, a revelation. We saw what happened with the revelation of Maria. 2,000 years of suffering came to the world. Christian Inquisition, Spain, Portugal, Holocaust, pogroms, from a dream of a prostitute who cheated on her husband. That's it. From that, two billion people today follow this idol named JC. Why? One dream. A lot of dreams. There's people that uh, live in illusion even when they're awake, not when they sleep. When they awake, they have dreams. In the middle of the day, they daydream. Please cut it out. It's not Judaism. He had a dream. That dream. This rabbi claimed that this tzaddik came to him in a dream. Enough. Don't buy this. Please. Enough with these things. If he dream, it comes from what he thinks during the day. And sometimes he didn't even dream. People like attention. They like to be on the news. You know, if there is an opportunity to get free publicity, why not? Don't follow this nonsense. Nothing will help us without massive tshuva, a serious root canal. I have to go to the root and clean it from the root, not on the surface. We usually deal only with the, with the uh, symptoms. We deal with the symptoms of the problem. We don't deal with the root of the problem. So when there is a tragedy like this, everyone is dealing with the symptoms that is on the top. Very few goes to the bottom to see how can I fix myself from the root. From the root. First, emuna. Emuna. We have no emuna. Everyone lives in fear. Everyone lives with agony. Everyone is sad. Everyone is in anxiety, panic attack, all kinds of depression pills. We don't have emuna. Since you don't have emuna, you suffer nonstop. People with emunah, they don't suffer. You may say, oh, it's easy saying than doing. Very easy to talk. What do you mean emunah? If you live there now in Ashkelon and every hour you get a, 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 a bomb falling in your neighborhood and sirens and people scream and people get hurt, where would be your emunah? What does it mean emunah? Emunah means nothing will happen to me. Nonsense. There's no such guarantee to anyone. Even Tzaddik sometimes finished his job in a world. When Tzaddik finished his job, Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman, the student of the Chafetz Chaim, Tzaddik Yesod Olam, one of the highest rabbis in Europe before the Holocaust, direct student of the Chafetz Chaim. He went to be with his student. He was out of, out of, out of the Holocaust. He could have saved. He could, he could stay in America. He went back to be with the student and got murdered by the Nazis. He didn't have a muna. I understand, but he didn't have a muna. Of course he had a muna. What happened in the end? He got killed. A muna, the Chazoni say, doesn't mean that Hashem is going to dance according to my music. That's not a muna. That's foolishness. A muna means... Everything that will happen to me, it's for my own good. Even if I die. If a missile falls directly on my head, it's good for me. That's called emuna. If chas v'shalom, I lose a child, it's emuna. It's Hashem knows what he's doing. Everything that happened to us, we brought it on ourselves, emuna. So now Hashem is cleaning us from something that could be a hundred times worse. One of the things they said is that there was a plan that everyone will attack Israel together. Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Jihad, and uh, Iran, everyone together. It was a plan to attack together. But the Hamas started before the time, and I messed up the whole thing. It was supposed to be an attack with everyone together. I want to tell you something. You know, the Hezbollah have 250,000 missiles. Huge one. Huge. So far, they do a little bit problems in the north. We kill about 50 of them. But it's small battles. They shoot a few small missiles. They have missiles that are much scary. Scary if the Chaz Shalom shoot them in Israel. They're huge. They're all the way from here to the door. 
That's how big they are. What would we do if a hundred of them would come every hour? So what do you see? Don't you see the hand of Hashem? Any second, we can all be dead. Logically, it won't be a surprise. It won't be a surprise. If Chaz Shalom, there was no Hashem. There was no protection from Hashem. It will be all nature. We have monsters that hate us more than the Nazis hate us. And they have unlimited amount of huge missiles. All they have to do is to press buttons and begin to kill hundreds for every missile. Hundreds, 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 chas v'shalom. It could be 10,000 deaths an hour. Every hour. And houses and buildings falling down. There are no ambulances, no doctors, no nothing. Who saves us from these monsters? Only Hashem. What are they waiting, these fools? We already have a laser gun. Few more months it will be ready for war. Do you know why it's not ready yet? It was supposed to be ready three years ago. Because the people that developed the Iron Dome use every political trick they can to postpone the laser gun. Because they make billions. Every missile, $100,000. Every system, tens of millions of dollars to put it. They make them and they sell them. If the laser gun will go, laser costs $3. To shoot laser on a rocket and blow it in the air, less than a cup of coffee. Less than a cup of coffee. To shoot one of their missiles, $100,000. We could have saved billions of dollars already and no one would die. And this laser, it's not only good for rockets, it's good for those big missiles as well. There's different amount of voltage. 50 kilobytes, 500 kilobytes, there's different lasers. And it's very, very cheap. After the development and the equipment and all the employees and everything, they calculate, if we would use now laser in this war, it would be $2,000 per laser. With all the, dev if you take all the investment until now. But the actual shot, $3. And not one missile will fall in Israel. Do you know what the difference it is in a war? Everybody goes to work as usual. We don't lose billions of dollars in economy. Nothing. Business as usual. Even flights would continue as usual. No one would be free. All the flights are canceled. Elal charged $6,000 to fly to Israel. $5,600. There's no competition now. No competition. All the American companies, they canceled their flights. All of that could have been prevented if Jews would not be greedy. Those who developed the Iron Dome, they would care more about the life of their family and the, and the people than to make billions of dollars. But in the end, it's all money. I don't understand. What do you want from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, from Europe, from the British Soccer League? It's all money there. Politics and money. If the politics and money is in your own backyard, your own friends and cousins and this, don't care that you die as long as they make money. And then we wonder, where was Hashem? Someone asked, where was Hashem in October 7? The answer is, Rabotai, if you are invited by a friend to a family of a friend, you have a friend, let's call him Itzik. Itzik invites you to a party of Avi. But Avi is your biggest enemy. Avi and his family hates you. Every time they see you, they spit at you, they curse you, they beat you up, they throw you out, don't come near us. Itzik that is not aware. He's inviting you to, a, hey, there's a party, Avi is making a party, come. No, I can't go. Why? Why can't you go? It's going to be a nice party. Ah, I'm not welcome there. What do you mean? Last time I was there, they spit at me. They kicked me out. They called me names. They threatened me not to ever show up. Anyone here will go to that party? Who's a masochist here? Anyone will go to a place that they spit at you and curse you and call your name and embarrass you in public? Why, Why are we not going to go? Because we are not welcome. Right? So people ask, where was Hashem? Hashem is not welcome. He was kicked out of Israel. 
Half of the people in Israel didn't want tefillot of Yom Kippur. They don't want prayers in Tel Aviv. They knocked down the mechitza. They sent girls with bathing suit in the middle of the, sh- of the shul. The shul was on the street. They didn't let the people pray. They, they don't agree to say Bezrat Hashem. All day and all night they spoke against Hashem and against the Torah. That parody and Simchat Torah on Shabbat was a welcoming invitation to Hashem or get out of here, we don't want to look at you. We don't want to hear from you. What was that parody? Oh, we love you so much, God, come. No, there was no God there. There was a Buddha statue over there. And lots of naked people and tons of drugs and who knows what else. Hashem cannot come to places like this. It's written in the Torah, Vaya machanecha kadosh. When I see lack of modesty, I cannot enter the place. I cannot enter a mixed wedding. I cannot enter a synagogue that the ladies are not modest and there's no kosher mechitza. I cannot enter any place that boys and girls are mixed, such as bars, disco, party places, beaches. I cannot come there. I cannot, I cannot enter any one of these kibbutzim. Besides two of them that were Shomrei Shabbat, all the other kibbutzim don't want anything to do with religion. Even mezuzot they didn't have. Many of them didn't have mezuzot. It's very interesting. I heard the testimony of someone that survived that the Arabs were looking for mezuzot <laughs> to know to what house to go. Because there's a lot of Thailandi workers and Indians and all kinds of people that are not, not Jewish. So they don't put mezuzot. But it's very interesting. In the end, they went to all the houses without the mezuzot, and there was one house in the whole area with mezuzah, and nobody entered that. They, in their mind, were looking for Jews. So where would you go? To a house with mezuzah or a house without mezuzah? What happened in the end? They went to all the houses without mezuzot. The one with the mezuzah, they didn't enter in the end. I said to myself, wow, that's mamash, an, an obvious miracle. So, Rabotai, all of what I told you now, it's written in parashat Lech Lecha. Avraham Avinu is 75 years old. His wife Sarah is 65 years old. They're already married for 50 years. 50, five zero. Today, if you marry five months and you don't, your wife is not pregnant, the rabbi gets a call. Rabbi, it's a big problem. Where can we send donation to? Why you remember me all of a sudden? Five months, we don't have kids. <laughs> okay, let's talk in two years. Ah, two years, we'll die by then. Two years? Five years? Five years, people will kill themselves. Mentally, they destroy everyone, the family, the parents, these, the in-laws. Why? They sit and counting the seconds. Abraham have been 50 years, no kids. When Hashem told him, relax, you will have your own son that will inherit you. This Eliezer, the servant, will not inherit you. I want you to go and tell the Goim, to stop killing their babies as a sacrifice to the gods. That's not what I want and that's not the right thing to do. So Avraham is preaching to the Goim about the one God, about being grateful to him, about eating and saying the grace of the food, about not killing your own children, about getting rid of your idols. Don't be idol worshippers. Look at my father, Terach. He was an idol worshipper. I grew up in a house of an idol worshipper. But I changed. I realized it's nonsense, all these idols. Avraham make an influence. He made a lot of ballet tshuva. And his wife was talking to the ladies. She also made ballot tshuva. After all of that, Hashem one day, soon we're going to see in the next parashot, that Hashem said to him, take your son, your only son, and slaughter him for me. Sacrifice him contradict completely everything he told him. And Abraham did not have one thought against Hashem. Not that he he just agreed to do it. 
I also would agree. You also would agree. Do you have a choice? <laughs> Hashem comes and says to you, sacrifice your son to me. What are you going to say? No, I'm going to rebel against you. I'm not going to rebel against you. If that's what you want, I'm, I'm going to do it with a broken heart, with tears, with depression, with sadness, with even anger. How do you promise me one thing and then you tell me to do the exact opposite? But at least I understand that I don't understand. Okay. Would it make me not angry? No. Would it make me not upset? No. Would it make me not sad? No. Would it make my mind clear and happy? No. I would be, I would be heartbroken. I would listen to Hashem. Because I know that He cannot fight with Him. But I would do it unwillingly. I wouldn't be happy to do it. Anyone else would be the same thing. Some people would not even do it. They say, you, you kill him, not me. If you want to sacrifice him, you do it. I cannot kill my own son. Everything I say, it's true or no? You agree? Yeah. Anyone here can imagine that after all these years, you waited for a boy, and God promised you that you're going to have your own boy who will inherit you and told you to warn the Goim not to kill their children, and now he said to you, take your son and slaughter him, and you would not have one thought negative about Hashem? Anyone think it can, it's possible to reach such a level? The answer, it's possible. It happened at least once, Avraham Avinu. So Rabotai, Avraham... Hashem said to him, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha, in numeric value, it's 100. Lech, Lamed, it's 30. Chaf, it's 20. So 30 and 20, it's 50. Lecha, it's also Lamed and Chaf. 50 plus 50, 100. Hashem is hinting to him, over here, you cannot have, you cannot have a child. But when you be 100 years old, you will have a child. You'll have a child. You'll have your own son. Not only that, Rabotai, Avram is leaving, and who joined the journey? Lot, his nephew Lot. Lot, he knows that Avram is very wealthy, and if if he won't join him, if Abraham will die one day, all the money will be given to other people. He won't be there to take what's his. He's the only one who inherits his uncle. So he has to defend his future assets. So he joined Abraham. And now, Abotai, it's very interesting. They go on the way. Abraham gives Lot. Abraham knows that Lot is greedy. Why would he join me? I'm his old uncle. He can stay in his place. What does he need to follow me? The decree is on me. When I have to go to exile, right now I'm in my place. Everyone admires me. Everyone respects me. Everyone bow down to me. I'm a leader. Everyone, you know, recognize who I am. Now I have to go to unknown place. It does, Hashem doesn't even tell me to wear. Unknown. I have to pack all my stuff and move. And I don't even know where I'm going to. Why will he join me? The answer for the money. It's a lot of money. It's thousands of cows, sheep, servants. It's a lot of money. Maybe gold, silver. So now, I want to remind you at that time, you couldn't tell who is young and who is old by age. People were not aging like today. And there was no sicknesses. So Lot looks exactly like Avram. If you see both of them, you mix between them, you don't know who is Avram, who is Lot. In the middle of the way, they have a fight, the shepherds. And Lot, Avram said to him, why should we fight? We are brothers. You know, you're the son of my brother. Son of a father is like the father. Let me give you enough wealth, meaning I know why you came with me. But he does it in a nice way. Take your own sheep. Your, your, your future is secure. Don't have to follow me to watch when, when I'll die. Take enough and, and choose a place. Where did he choose? This. <laughs> and ungrateful, it's an understatement. His uncle just gave him wealth. 
Be independent. You don't have to wait for me to die. Here, you have enough money to live. And he chose a side, he chose the green side. Why? That the sheep will get fat. There's a lot of food for them. The desert, there's nothing to eat. They stay skinny. So he doesn't mind to cause financial damage to his uncle. As long as he gets what he wants. Why? Greed. You know, there are two things when, they, when you combine between them. It's a nuclear bomb. Each one of them by itself is a bomb. But when you mix between them, it's a nuclear bomb. Do you know what it is? Greed and bad traits. Midot raot and greed. Ta'avat mamon. Once a person has bought, it's a, an explosive material. Greed is like a drug addict. Money, 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 all the time. Oef kesef, lo isba kesef. Shlomaneh rotze matayim. Shlomaneh rotze arbamot. Not only that he doesn't ever get satisfied from how much he has, the, the wealthier he gets, the hungrier he gets for more money. It's very interesting. When he had one million, his dream was one day to have two. Once he reached the two, his dream is to have four. Once he got to four, he said, what's four? I, can, I could have had eight. And eight, he won 16, and 16, he won 32. And once he has a billion, he's now thinking in billions. So when he had one million, how much was he missing? One million. That was his dream, to double his, his assets. When he had a billion, what's his dream? To get another billion. So when is he hungrier? The more he has, the hungrier he gets. Tov. Greed and bed midot. That's Lot. Lot separated. Where did he go? To Harvard University. He wanted to finish law school. Then he became a lawyer. No, no, no joke. That's exactly what happened, just in a primitive format. We're trying to imagine if it was today, how we would tell the story. So Lot went to law school. Graduated, they were so happy that a religious guy from the yeshiva left the yeshiva and came to law school. The goyim that they said, we will do everything to promote your success. That we can be so proud that we have a Hasidish judge that came to us from Boro Park. Hasidish judge. And after Lot got his law degree, where did he move to? San Francisco. Sodom. He moved to Sodom. And what did they do? Immediately put him in the Supreme Court of San Francisco. He didn't have to be a little judge. Immediately to the top court. He was the judge of Sodom. That's why it's written that Lot is sitting in the gate of the town. Why the Torah is to waste the whole sentence to tell us where Lot is sitting? If he sits in Union Turnpike, or on Main Street, or on Queens Boulevard, does it make a difference where he sits? You told me that he's a wicked judge, an ex-religious person, and now he moved to Sodom, and that's it. Who cares if he sits in the middle of Sodom, or in the entrance? The answer is because the way of the world was that every city in the world that you arrive to, when you enter the gate, the cities are surrounded with walls, when you enter the gate, there are guards. As soon as you get permission to enter the place, what do you see in front of you? The court. The first thing you see when you arrive to a city, you see the court. Why? All of them build the courts in the entrance to the town. Why the court has to be right when you enter? The court cannot be in the middle. The court cannot be in the other side. Why does it have to be right by the entrance? The answer is that people will get scared. That they know they came to a place that there is law and order over there. Don't mess with the authorities over here. We have police and we have court. 
just like when you arrive to Singapore. You land in the airport, you come, you want to enter, they give you a note. What does it say on the note? On the note, welcome to Singapore, the country that for using drugs or distributing drugs, we will give you the death penalty. That's the welcome to Singapore. No wonder that you don't have one criminal incident there in the entire year. No robberies, no rapes, no murder, no one throw a gun on the floor. The streets are completely clean, no graffiti. Everything is organized, no crime. No crime over there. How can it be? A place of so many idol worshippers and no crime? The answer is yes. People fear the authorities. It's not like the democratic state that everyone does whatever they want. Why? Liberalism. Liberalism wants freedom. Freedom is poison. When people become fully free, they become monsters. They rape, they steal, they cheat, they lie, full of abomination, corruption, politics, dirty politics. Everyone step on the head of each other. No one is afraid of the laws. And the lawyers are even bigger criminals. They, the Pirkei Avot say that uh, the lawyers have to be very careful. Why? Because from when they speak, the defendant would learn how to lie. I imagine if the Chachamim would live today and they go one day to the court here in Queens Boulevard or Manhattan, Federal Court Plaza there and see what's happening there or in Tel Aviv with the rotten, wicked, lefty judges there and zero justice, zero justice. Some courts in the world, you may have 50% justice. From 100 cases, 50% were judged fairly. 50%, it's a very nice achievement. In Israel, 0%. 0% justice. 0%. If you walk into the court with the Amaka, you lost before you. It's a waste of time to take a lawyer. Chaval ala kesef. I'm talking from experience. Waste of time. Chaval, you, you lose double. The lawyer will milk you, milk you for a lot of money. And to begin with, once the judge sees that you're a religious Jew, he hates you more than you can imagine. Especially if you're a speaker that put the lefties down and promote religion. Oh, for him, you're the head of the Hamas. The head of the Hamas he loves. The head of the speakers he hates. Why? What do you expect? So Lot arrived to San Francisco. Yoshev B'Sha'ar Ha'ir. Rashi writes, like the Midrash say, Minu oto liot shofet. The people of Saddam say, what? You a Hasidic Jew? You went to Harvard Law School? We're giving you immediately a seat in the Supreme Court of Saddam. That's what happened. In the meantime, we have a big Russia in the world, the, the Hitler of those days. What was his name? Nimrod. Nimrod. Nimrod was uh, pretending to be a god. And he's a, he's, a, he's a ruthless murderer. Anything you can think of of this monster, you ha he has. And what does he do? He has a plan. When Avram was a kid, his father, the fool, Terach, turned Avram into the hands of Nimrod. He said, my son is too fanatic in a religion. He refused to accept you as the God. He said that the God is in the God of the heaven and earth. There's only one God. And said that you are just a pretender. I want to report him. They took Avraham and they started to ask him questions. And everything Nimrod say, Avraham gives him an answer. In the end, Nimrod lost his patience and he said, listen, if you're so, you're so sure of your God to defend you, let me throw you into the fire and we'll see if you will defend you or not. His brother Haran was there also. So Avraham said, you can do whatever you want. That's called emuna. 
Will I get saved? No. Maybe I'll, be, maybe I'll die. I'll die on Kiddush Hashem. I live, I die. Life and death is an end of Hashem. If I deserve to live and Hashem wants me to live, with or without the fire, I would live. If He wants me to die, even without me more than the fire, I have to die. So I have to make sure to do what's right. Life and death, it's not in my hand. Wealth or poverty, it's not in my hand. People would like me or hate me, it's not in my hand. It's in their hand. They have free will to decide. I have to do what's right. So Abraham say, I will not acknowledge you as a God. He threw him into the fire, but the fire, they, they, they made the fire for days. The hardest furnace you can think of. When they got too close to it, they got burned. The servants of, it, of uh, Nimrod, they all got burned. So you know how they threw Abraham into the fire? They couldn't come near it. That's how bad it was. They shot him with a slingshot. You know a slingshot? Like, like a slingshot. They pull it, and Abraham went into the fire. Into the hardest fire ever. Thousands of degrees. And he walked inside, and he's not burning. Clear miracle. They asked Aran, who are you with? You with Nimrod or you with Avram? He said, I'm biased. <laughs> they threw him in and he died. Avram died. Avram got saved. So Nimrod, biggest enemy is Avram Avinu. As long as he's alive, everyone knows I'm a faker. So Nimrod came up with a wonderful plan of wicked mastermind. What was the plan? Avraham is righteous. I cannot twist his mind and he will never agree to bow down to me. But his nephew is a faker. He used to be religious. He went to Harvard Law School and now he's a judge in Sodom. Let me go grab him. Take him with me to a tour. All over. People would think it's Avraham Avinu because they look alike. That's the plan. Why all of a sudden he wants to capture Lot? He could have gone to a war with Avram. He knows where Avram is. He went to Lot. Why? Lot, in a minute, will say everything for some attention and money and definitely not to die. So he went and captured Lot. Now they come and they say to Avram, your nephew is in, he's a hostage. Who came to tell Avraham? Og. Og. A palit. Palit means the, the one that got rescue. Rescue from what? From the flood. Lo, Og, numeric value. Og is how much? 79. Mabul, it's 78. In his name, there is a hint that he was a little bit above the water. His head was above the water, 79, and the, and the Mabu 78. He was grabbing to the ark and survived. This og ran to tell Avraham that his nephew Lot is in the prison of Nimrod. Why og became such a tzaddik? All of a sudden, it was a wicked person. Why would he run to Avraham to tell him, your nephew is in capture. He's in jail by the Hamas. Go to Gaza and save him. Because Og was sure that Avraham will die. That the people of Sodom will kill him. And once they'll kill him, he will grab his wife, the prettiest woman in the world, Sarah. Her beauty was breathtaking. Couldn't look at her and not faint for her beauty. That's how pretty she was. Especially in a place when they all look horrible. Like Rashi said, there were very ugly people there. So Lot, now he's in jail. Where? By Nimrod. And Abraham just found out that his nephew is in jail. I want to ask you a question. Let's, let's try to understand what's happening here. Now you have the biggest Chacham in the world. Who is he? Rav Moshe Sternbuch. Posekado. After all the Chachamim passed, now we have one Chacham left, Rav Moshe Sternbuch. I'm can close to 100 years old. Rav Moshe Sternbuch, 
But let's describe a scenario that you have a nephew that used to be in yeshiva, left the yeshiva, and went to the party in the south on October 7. Took some drugs, took off his shirt, jumped like this for two days, Shabbat, tam ta tam ta ta tam music of going, put few earrings, you know, took all kinds of things to improve the mood, and was captured by the Hamas. And now he's somewhere in Gaza, place that you usually go in, it's hard to come out. Why their name is Aza? Milashon Azut, Az Panim Lagenom, Az, Azut, Chutzpa, Chutzpa like a dog, you walk next to a dog, he barks at you, wants to murder you. What did I do to you? Just walked by the fence of the house. Wow, 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 wow. That's called Azut. So what happened? Rav Moshe Sternpoch found out that his nephew now is in Gaza. He collects 318 Bachurei Shiva from his yeshiva. Get whatever you can come with. Some knife, sword. Let's go into Gaza tonight. Search for my nephew and save his life. It's almost a guarantee to die. Not for him, for the whole 318 people. Something like this. If the rabbi would hear such thing, he would risk his life. If he was, this nephew was a big Talmid Chacham, Gdol Ador, Tzadik. No, I'm sacrificing my life to save this Tzadik nephew of mine. For the sake of my brother, for the sake of my parents, I have to give my life to save my nephew. Why such a tzaddik is in the capture of this horrible Hamas, Nimrod is holding him now. Let me go risk, risk my life. But according to the Torah, you're not allowed to risk your life to go save such a person. It's against Hashem's will. Why are you going to die for someone wicked who hates Hashem? used to be religious and kicked the Torah and left the Torah. So Hashem gave him a punishment, now I'm going to have to die for him? I take 318 Bachurei Shiva, all of us will die to save that guy? That eating on Yom Kippur? Makes sense? What do you think? What, Avraham Avinu lost his mind? What's happening here? You read the parasha and you don't think? Why will he go to a war? Take Eliezer. Eliezer was the biggest goy tzaddik in the world. He went to heaven with his body. Hashem took Eliezer. He's one of the Asara tzaddikim. Bechayim, Hashem picked him up. Like you have Hanoch, you have few of them. Rav Yoshua ben Levi, few. The Gemara brings a list of Asara tzaddikim. Some of them were goyim. Aved Melech Kushi. At least three or four of them are not Jewish. They went to heaven express without death. They were not buried. Hashem sanctified their body and took it together with the soul. Something that we have no understanding what it means. He is one of them, Eliezer. He was also a Talmud Chacham. Everything Avraham knew, he knew. He was always attached to him. Why risking Avraham and Eliezer, the two biggest tzaddikim in the world, plus 318 others, to go save this San Francisco liberal Bernie Sanders. That's, what, that's, it. that's really what happened here. Imagine Bernie Sanders would be taken by Hamas after giving his life for them. They don't care. They took a lot of other lefties and tortured them and murdered them. And many of the people that are sitting now by their jail is all lefties, almost all of them. All of them, they took them from the party, from the kibbutzim. They can care less. You lefty, righty. You Jew, that's it. You must die. So now imagine Bernie Sanders will be sitting in Gaza now. We should have made the biggest parties in the world to get rid of this Jew-hater, anti-Semite, Nazi Jew, if he's a Jew, bichlal. According to Bernie Sanders, all of us has to die. All the Hamas and ISIS and Al-Qaeda have to be promoted. 
The Torah has to be burned. That's Bernie Sander, the communist socialist, hater of God, one of the most wicked people in the whole world. He is now in Gaza, and the yeshiva has to risk their life to go save him? We should have sent a mazal tov car to the Hamas for doing us a favor. Such a lefty liberal judge from Saddam Lot who left the yeshiva and left his uncle and went to live with the most wicked people in the history? We have to risk our life to save him? It's against the Torah. It's against Hashem. It's against the Torah. It's against Halakha. And it's against common sense. Now I want to remind you that sometimes you hear in lectures common mistakes. Common mistakes. Last week, I spoke half an hour about one of those common mistakes. That they say that everyone who got killed because he's a Jew expressed is going to heaven. Nonsense. It's not true. I brought many, many proofs. Even Rav Moshe Sternbuch said that, Rav Avigdor Miller, Rav Dessler. They all talked about it. It's not true. I don't want to repeat it now. If you want to know the, the, the proofs, listen to last Monday lecture. There is another common mistake that is done by a lot of speakers. That they say that Abraham Avinu prayed for all the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities. That Hashem, Abraham had an argument with Hashem not to kill the wicked people. That's uh, misleading. That's fake news. That's a lie. It never happened. Abraham can care less about the wicked people. He only cared about the righteous one. So, Ma, you're going to kill the righteous with the wicked? Listen, read carefully what's written in the parasha. Are you going to kill the righteous with the wicked? Does he care about the wicked? Not in, for a second. Are you going to kill the tzaddikim with the reshaim? Shofet kol haaretz lo yaseh mishpat. The judge of the universe will not be a fair judge. How do you plan to kill righteous people together with the wicked? Maybe there are ten righteous people in every city, fifty tzaddikim. They're going to die? Hashem said, no. If there will be fifty tzaddikim, I won't kill anyone. Not just the righteous. The wicked will get saved for the time being. Abraham realized there's no fifty. Maybe there will be forty-five. There's no 45. 40, 30, 20, 10. No, not even 10 tzaddikim. Abraham rest his case. At any given moment, Abraham cared about the wicked? Absolutely not. Excuse me, but it's a lie to say such thing. But almost everyone say it. Abraham cared about the reshaim of Sdom. Absolutely not. Be'avod reshaim rina. Abraham Avinu doesn't know what Hashem likes and what he hates. I want to get Hashem angry, upset. If Hashem decides to clean the world from the wicked people, I have to be the reason he won't do it? How will I even dare to open my mouth? I care about the righteous. Now when you say there are no righteous, Abraham didn't pray for the wicked. If Abraham cared about the wicked, when Hashem told him there's no righteous people there at all, Abraham should have said, okay, but what about all the wicked? You want to kill millions of wicked people? Don't you care about them? But Abraham never said it. You get the point or no? So if Abraham didn't care about the wicked, why all of a sudden he cared about the most wicked, the traitor that left him and left the religion and went to Sodom to be a judge? I don't know if you know, but the laws of Sodom were designed to be always against the Torah, against God. Everything was against God. If someone steals from you, you have to compensate him. If someone broke your bone, you have to pay him for that. Everything the opposite. If someone wants to save the toll on a bridge and he goes in the water, they wait for him on the other side, they charge him double toll. Short people... They stretch them too much to the bed if they come. Tall people, they chop their legs that they should fit into the bed. They did horrible things to torture people. It was against the law to have guests. 
if someone got caught having a guest in his house, execution. A lot of un- unbelievable things. Sodom and Gomorrah. Even today when you go to the Tel Aviv criminal court, if one person took advantage on a woman, how they define the crime? Maaseh Sodom. An act of Sodom. You ask the Israeli liberal judge from Tel Aviv, can you explain to me what does it mean an act of Sodom? He has no idea. He's such an ignorant person, never opened the Torah once in his life. He doesn't even know what does it mean, Maaseh Sodom. But you know, it's written in the laws of the Israeli court, act of Sodom. Ask him, do you know what they did in Sodom? Do you know what happened to them in the end? Do you know what God did to them? He never heard of it. The judge, he doesn't know what Sodom is. So, who can explain to me why Abraham would do something that is totally not logical? Very good. There's only one reason for it. There's nothing that Abraham was more afraid than Chilul Hashem. That the name of God will be disgraced because of me. If Nimrod is going to take the wicked nephew of mine Lord all over the world and he will declare him as a God, that means the people that follow me, people that learn my ideology, people that learn from me the Ashkafa, the real Ashkafa of the one God, all the Baalei Tshuva in the world will go back to be idol worshippers. For that, I'm going to die, if I have to. Because he goes with 100% intention for the sake of heaven, Hashem made him another huge miracle. They picked up the sand and threw it, and the sand became arrows. He was winning the war in an unbelievable way. And what did he do? He released Lot. Now I want to ask you another question. When Abraham came with Lot and Sarah to Paro, the king of Egypt, immediately they took Sarah to the palace of Paro. And Abraham said to her, say that you are my sister. Why? That first they won't kill me. And second, that they will give me gifts. Later on, when the king of Sodom was saved in a war, thanks to Avraham Avinu, he wanted to give Avraham Avinu a gift. Let me pay you. Avraham say, I do not want to take from you even a shoelaces. Shoelaces. That you won't ever say, thanks to you I became wealthy. So, with Lot... He didn't want to accept one dollar. He didn't want to take from him. How did he take gift from Paro? Who is Paro? Who is the the king of Sodom? Two wicked people. Why from one he agreed to take all the gifts and to become wealthy? And from the other one he refused to take? What's going on here? The answer is Rabotai. When Abraham went, he stayed in hotels. But he didn't have enough money to pay them. He said to them, don't worry, I'm good for the money. Everyone knew he's a tzaddik. For you, will make an exception to the rule. Usually we don't take a guest without paying up front. Or at least leave your credit card for security, something. <laughs> you know? But you, Abraham Avino, you are known as a very righteous speaker. Everywhere you give seminars, you make Baalei Tshuva. It's an honor for us to have you as a guest. And when you have the money, we sure you will come and pay back. Now, right after that, he goes to Egypt. They kidnapped his wife. Who are you? Sister of this man, Avram. I don't get it. What did Avram gain by saying that she's his sister? What's the point? He, wa- he knew that if he would say that it's his wife, 
the goyim will kill him in order for them to take her and give her to Paro. If she's married, they can take it to Paro. The goyim, no, married, married, finished. But here, they will kill me. But I don't get it. What's worse? To take a married woman to their house or to murder someone? It's the same thing. It's a terrible crime. Why would the goyim rather do this crime and not this crime? You get the question or no? The answer is, sometimes we have in life a dilemma. What's better? To do one huge crime once and that's it? Or many small crimes over the years? Here, if they would take a married woman, Sarah, to the house of Paro, everybody knows she's married to Avram. If Avram is alive, then I'll have to touch her. So every time they go, it's a, it's a crime. But if they'll kill Avram, it's one crime, and that will save them from hundreds of other crimes. So better to kill him and get rid of the problem. If we keep him alive, it will be a lot more. So one time is a crime that will save us from many other different crimes. Same thing if we have a sick person now. Sick person. In Shabbat, we have to feed him not kosher. There's no kosher food. We have two options. To slaughter a goat on Shabbat, which is Chilul Shabbat, 100%, and feed him kosher, or to take one of the dead animals and feed him. What's better? To slaughter, to slaughter a goat and feed him kosher meat? Or to let him eat from a dead goat that was there, take some meat and give him, let him eat. We may think better, better to eat from the, from the dead goat. But the answer, better to slaughter for him a goat. Why? It's Chilul Shabbat. For the sake of a sick person. Right? Even though it's not permitted, but it's a one sin. If we feed him from the dead animal, every ounce he eats is a new sin. Kazait nevela. Kazait nevela. Kazait, 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 kazait. could be 50 kazait. 50 different sins. Yes, that's the question that I had. But how can it be to do shechita, which is mamash chilul Shabbat? So we have to say, I guess, that we have pikuach nefesh here. It says it's a person that if you don't feed him, he will die. Otherwise, it's not permitted either way. If he's not going to die, we're not allowed to do neither one of them. Not nevela and not shechita. But here he needs to eat meat. The doctor says he must eat meat, otherwise by, by tomorrow he'll be dead. So we have two options, to feed him meat from a dead animal or to feed him meat from a slaughtered animal that we broke Shabbat for. But when we break Shabbat, it was for the sake of uh, pikuach nefesh. But we could have given the nevelot also for pikuach nefesh. But nevelot is many sins. And here is only one. So, Rabotai, there are many questions like this in halacha. We must do one. Which one will be better to do? Which one it will be better to do? Either way, Rabotai, Avram is thinking now, I must release Lot because it's going to be a very big Chilul Hashem. People would say that I became secular, that I became an idol worshiper, that everything I taught them, I actually took back. I changed my mind. I, 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 I announced Nimrod as a god. That would be the end of me, of my legacy, of all my seminars. For this, I'm going to die. But we still have to understand why why Abraham agreed to take gifts from Paro and doesn't agree to take gifts from the king of Sodom. Not only that, Abraham actually expected gifts from Paro. And when he gave him the gifts, he, he took the gifts. The reason is, Rabotai, because it's very big Chilul Hashem to owe money and not to pay. The longer you hold the money, the more Chilul Hashem it is. The Chachamim in the old days, they refused to take meat for Shabbat unless they had the money. 
The owner of the butcher shop said, Rabbi, don't worry, when you have, you come pay. No, I'm not going to take it. But you don't have right now the cash. I'll, I will eat on Shabbat other things without meat. It's mitzvah to eat meat. It's more mitzvah to pay on time. Especially if it's workers who did a job for you. Beyomot iten schalo. Once it's getting dark, sunset, and you don't pay him, every second it's a sin from the Torah. Every second, it's no joke. How many people owe money and they don't pay for years and years? If one day they pay, the value of the money is already nothing. If someone took $100,000 five years ago, with $100,000 five years ago, you can buy a property in a nice town. Now he comes and pay it. The 100000 today, it's like 20000 of five years ago. Can't even buy a car with that, almost. A nice car. The money lost its value. Yes, the Torah doesn't obligate you to pay interest and penalty. You took a loan and you pay five years later. The question is, if you had the money all alone, and you, you rather invest your money and do business on the expense of a Jew sitting five years and suffering, do you think Hashem would let it go? You're going to have to pay the price. Ah, but I paid in the end. Yes. It's called Naval Birshuta Torah. A villain that acting according to the law, like some of these lawyers. They find a loophole. But it's not ethical, it's not morality. But it's, it's legal. It's also legal to smoke drugs and mess up the head of all the people in this country. It's legal because the government is stupid or the government does not want to deal with this pandemic. That everyone is a drug addict. Many of the drugs the pharmacy sell, it's also killers. But it's good. The government gets a lot of taxes from it. They're very happy. Why not? They make billions. Cigarettes. Why cigarettes is legal? They should have given a death penalty to someone that sells cigarettes. Because cigarettes kill people. Then everyone will touch cigarettes will be death penalty. No one will touch it. But they're very happy with that. Philip Morris sell a pack of cigarettes for $3 and you pay $17. Where is the other $14 go? To Sleepy Joe and his friends. Hussein Obama, the rest of them. Very good. Everyone is happy. Partners to the crime. Same thing colleges. Biggest scam on earth. Everyone eats from the cake. Same thing weapon. All the weapon in the world. They create wars all the time. Otherwise, who are we going to sell weapon to? And airplanes. Every B-52, whatever the name of it, it's over $100 million. If there's not going to be wars, how Americans will make a living? So much corruption. So Rabotai, Avram knew that he has debt. If I would not take the gift, usually I hate gifts. So Nematanotich here it's written. Someone that hates gifts would live longer. Why? What's the connection? Remember, everything Hashem does is measure for measure, for good and for bad. So if you do something good, Hashem will pay you in the same coin. If you do something bad, Hashem will punish you in the same coin. What's the connection between someone who waits to receive free gifts to live longer life? Who knows? No, who's clever here? What's the connection? The answer, someone wants to give you a car for free. Costs $10,000. And you are a worker who makes $5,000 a month. You will have to work two months to make the money for the car. Someone just gave you the car for free, saves you two months of work. If you refuse to take the car for free, now you have to work two months to make what you had for free. So Hashem has to take all the gifts that people offered you and you refuse to take. Calculate how much time He took you to make that money and add it to your life. So if you're supposed to die at 70, you live until 85. Same thing if you teach Torah to others. And it comes on the expense of your learning. You're in yeshiva. Some people need help. 
you teach them. You help this 10 minutes, 5 minutes, you answer questions. Over the years, you lose a year of learning. You give this one 5 minutes, this one 10 minutes, this one half an hour. So overall, you add all the time you teach others. It came from your amount of knowledge that you could have gained. Hashem has to give you more life. Why? To pay back for all the time you gave the public. If you want to live long life and be secure from all kinds of accident and problems and cancer and uh, Hamas and terrorism and who knows how, what's the best way to do it? Rav Volbe Alava Shalom, the Mashgiach, the Holy Mashgiach, he wrote that if you want Hashem to be forced to keep you alive, to be forced, meaning he doesn't want he wanted to take you away from the world. You now 75. That's what Hashem had in mind for you. 75 years of life. Rosh Hashanah, you're 74 and a half. So by Nisan, around Pesach, you have to go. You're going to be 75. That's what Hashem wanted you from the day you came to the world. How are you going to force Hashem to keep you here another 15, 20 years until 95? You make sure a lot of Jews are dependable on you. The more Bachure Yeshiva is sponsor, your debt will be a tragedy for them, financially. They're not going to have a peace of mind to learn. It's to the best interest of Hashem to keep you alive against His original plan for the sake of the 50 or 100 or 500 people that eat thanks to you. Or that becoming more knowledgeable in Torah thanks to you. That's why almost all G'dolei Israel reach the age of 100. Almost all of them. Don't you see? Something here is <laughs> against the law of nature. Other old people, if they make it to 80, it's a great achievement. 80, 85, wow, long life. Almost every G'dol Torah, 93, 95, 97, 100, 101, 102, 107, Today, I think it's the outside of Rav Shach, 106, I think. Yesterday was the Chazonish. Bezrat Hashem, this Divrei Torah will be also for the Ilui Neshama for them. Even the greatest people in history can use elevation to their soul. Why? Because uh, when we sponsor a lecture, let's say sometimes people sponsor a lecture, the merit of all the Torah and all the thousands of hours of Torah that people will hear and listen and improve themselves, it's not only to get a wicked person out of hell and transfer him to heaven. It's also to upgrade the people that are in heaven. That's why we say Kaddish for the most righteous people. If your father is Rav Ovadia, he needs your Kaddish. It's the greatest Chacham in the world. He has Chuyot of all the Sfaradim in the world. So many yeshivot, so many great things happen thanks to him. All his books in every home. Wow, 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 what a heaven he has. And we still, all his sons say Kaddish for him and many of his students. What for? Even when you're in a high, very high level, you can go higher and higher and higher. There's no limit. Only in a physical world there is an end to the progress. But in a spiritual world there is no limit. You can go higher and higher and higher and Hashem has unlimited amount of reward. There's no limit. So Rabotai, why Avram took the money from Paro? Because Paro owed him compensation. You stole my wife to your house? When Avram say, say that you're my sister, how Avram is going to save Sarah? He's going to save his life. But what about your wife? You're not afraid of your wife? She's going to be in the house of uh, Khaled Mishal, in Machshimo or Sinwar, in the house of such a monster, Paro. Your wife is in Gaza now, in the house of the mass terrorist. And you are alive to know that your wife is there in his bedroom? How can you live a minute? The answer is, say that you're my sister, but you are married. Your husband is not in the country. You came with your brother. But your husband is with the kids. <laughs> Why? Because they won't dare to touch you. 
That's one of the explanations. <coughs> so Abraham takes the gift from Paro, he goes back, Rashi writes, to pay all the debt from all the hotels where he was. With Sodom, with the king of Sodom, he didn't owe me, Avram say. The only reason he got into trouble in first place was because of my nephew, the wicked nephew. My nephew got him into this trouble. He went to Sodom. And now they came, Nimrod, to start a war with Sodom. Give us, give us lot. They said, no, it's our judge. He's in the Supreme Court. Give us the judge. We want him. We won't touch you. No, we're not turning him in. Look how much they admire the former religious lot. You became one of us. You are too precious. We rather go to a war and have thousands of dead, not to lose a Hasidish judge that moved to our secular court. You know what an asset it is? A person who used to have peot and a beard and a fair hat and now is a judge in Manhattan with an earring? Do you know what a PR it is for us? Like Iran. You know how many millions Iran, Iran gives to this Hasidish Neture Karta in Machshimam Vezichram, the traders? How they walked on Brooklyn Bridge on Shabbat, Mechalele Shabbat, carrying all kinds of things, Metaltelim Bershut Arabim. Working at the service of the monster Palestinian Nazis, standing in Washington and Shabbat talking to the microphone with their beards and peos and fair hats. And the world is confused because usually when you see people with fair hats and, 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 and beards and peot, they are usually very nice religious people with good midot and love to Hashem and love to the, to, to the Holy Land. None of them can stand these monster mass murderers. How all of a sudden you have dozens of these looks Hasidish holding Palestinian flags. Of course, they get tons of money for that. There's no better PR for Iran than these fools. You're right. You can take an Arab and dress him Hasidish. The problem is how you're going to teach him Yiddish. It's a little bit hard, you know. Do you get the point? What's happening here? One time they burned a house of one of them. I think it was in Monsi. And a week later he already got the money for a new house. Iran. Shh. Iran would put billions of dollars into these fools. Why? Do you know when the, the Iranian president came here to the United Nations a few months ago? The only people who were permitted into his room were these Neture Karta. No one. They don't trust anyone. They only let them in. You see the video how they kiss the, the president of Iran. We admire you. It's unbelievable, you know. Satmer kicked them out many years ago. Kicked them out. Because they realized there are rotten apples. You had beautiful apples in a basket. Some of them got rotten. You got to get rid of them before everyone else will be rotten. So they threw them out. What's the difference between the ideology of Satmer to this Neture Karta in Machshimam? I'll tell you. Both of them cannot stand the Zionist. Communist, socialist, wicked, Israeli, Russian, Polish, communist, who came to establish a secular, wicked state in Israel. Both of them cannot stand it. Every God-fearing Jew has to hate those Reshaim. They cut the peot of the Temanim. They force all the Sfaradim to become Mechalelei Shabbat. They force them into Ma'abarot. They made Kibbutzim and Moshavim to do everything against Hashem and against the Torah. But there is one difference between Satmer and this Reshaim. Satmer hate the Tzioinim, hate the Kamenists, hate people like Bernie Sanders. It's mitzvah to hate them. If you don't hate them, you hate Hashem. It's either them or Hashem. If you hate Hashem, you love them. If you love Hashem, you must hate them. You cannot love someone who take a religious boy and cut his peot and force him to be Mechalel Shabbat. You cannot love him because the Gemara say, Gadol ha-machti'o yoter min ha-orgo. 
you burn, you murder the soul of a Jew as a lot worse than to murder his body. You murder his body, if he was righteous, he goes to heaven. You murder his soul, he lost his share to the world to come. It's no joke here. It's, a, it's an eternal death. All the deaths of this world are temporary death. You die and you can go to heaven and you continue to live there. But if you die wicked because someone made you wicked, you lost your eternity. That's an eternal death. A death of the soul. So that's what they did. They took millions of Jews and turned them into 100% goyim. No Shabbat, no kosher food, goyish names, goyish behaving, goyish ashkafa, and ideology, admiring all these Hollywood movies, horrible music, terrible behavior, horrible clothing, lack of modesty, terrible society. So many secular schools who educate kids to be gays and anti-God and hate Judaism and hate religion, make a mockery out of the religion, torture rabbis, torture yeshivot, abuse Haredim and all kinds of Bnei Torah. That's what came out of the Zionist wicked state. They made the real Holocaust to us. It's called silent Holocaust. When the Holocaust came by Hitler and his friends, 80% of the Jews in Europe were already intermarried, unfortunately. Germany, Austria, even in Poland, in Warsaw, you have the video of that big, uh, the, the, the Chacham from Yerushalayim, he's in, in his 90s. One person told him when I spoke about the Holocaust, that many of the people that died were not even Jewish, because their mother was not Jewish. All the kids were not Jewish. The Nazis killed them as Jews. So in the end, there were a lot of them that were not Jewish according to the Torah, but the Nazis killed them anyway. Why? Because the father of the family was a Jew. But the wife and all the children were not Jewish. But they killed all, the whole six. One was Jew, five was Goim. They killed them. Why? Doesn't matter. You have Jew for us, you Jew. But according to I, only Jewish if your mother is Jewish. Doesn't matter who the father is. So what happened? So... They, they went and they killed all the people over there. Some of them, so they came to that man in the Jerusalem. I don't know if you saw, I once posted the video on a WhatsApp group, on a Facebook. Someone asked him, some rabbi in America said that many of the people that the Nazis killed were not Jewish. He said, he's right. He said, where are you from? He said, Warsaw. He said, no, in Warsaw there were intermarriage. He said, yes, at least half of the people in Warsaw were married non-Jewish girls. Later I got a video from the Warsaw, and I saw the Bloriot, no kippa, blonde Bloriot, dressed like goyim. That's the Jewish community in Warsaw. You had the Hasidim, they were very religious, Hasidim. But then you had uh, <laughs> the modern Reform and conservative and all of that, tons of them. Not like Germany, but there was everywhere intermarriage. And in the end, a lot of them that they killed were actually not Jewish according to the Alakha. And those who were Jewish, some of them were already completely disconnected from Hashem. Who made all the Jewish people of Europe, so many of them, complete anti-religion? Moshe Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn, 220 years ago. 150 years before the Holocaust, he started the Ascala movement. Jews moving to colleges, to universities, learning with the Goim, leaving the yeshivot, and learning in universities. 150 years later, close to 80% were totally secular, anti-religion. Who really is responsible for all of that? Moshe Mendelssohn. His own sons converted to Christianity and married Christian women. Few years in university they became Christian. Moshe Mendelssohn was an Orthodox rabbi. Modern. What normal rabbi will go to university? Modern Orthodox. Open Orthodoxy. Like the one in my blacklist. Santa Claus and his friends. They love academic education. How they admire academic reshaim. Wow. You put Rav Eliashiv, Rav Ovadia, they'll make fun at Rav Ovadia. 
you bring some professor gay from Harvard, wow, PhD, wow. Why? Why is so why admire him so much? Because he no matter what. Because he learned a little bit about politics. Shtuyot. Rabotai, in the end, in the end, the Satmer, they hate everything that connects to the Israeli secular communist state and the education and the brainwash that they did to all the innocent Jews that came later on. But they never crossed the line to join the Nazis or the enemies or the Hamas or Iran to help them to murder Jews or to cheer when Jews are being murdered. Where is your head, you fool? As one thing, you hate the communists and Bernie Sanders and his friends. As the, on the other hand, you go and you join the Nazis and the people who murder innocent kids. You join Hamas and you're happy that they murder 1,400 people, include children and little girls. How, what's going on? The answer is money. You already hate the communist, the Zionist Reshaim. You don't love Iran and Hamas. You cannot stand them as well. Who would love these monsters? But if they give me millions of dollars, since I hate the other side, why not? I'll be their PR. You understand how it works? Please don't get confused when you see these people standing with Palestinian flags and you see other Satmer Hasidim. There's nothing to compare this to this. You understand, right? One is a diamond and, and one is not even a cubic zirconia. It's a piece of something who falls into the bathroom and needs to be flushed. That's what they are, these people. And Hashem is, as we speak, building a new section in hell for them. Something very advanced. Because all the other places were not... Nobody ever thought that we're going to have such traders among us. You know one thing I want to tell you, in the state of Israel, there is no death penalty. Besides one law, betraying the country, cooperating with the enemy, being a spy for the enemy, giving the enemy secrets, who caused the death of Israelis, that's called Bgida. For Bgida, you have death penalty. Now, recently, they passed another law. What is it? Debt to terrorists. How come nobody makes big noise out of it? Because everyone knows they will never execute any terrorist. They're just, you know, po political announcement. It's a political announcement. But I, if you ask me, every terrorist, the smallest one, someone who never shot anyone, but put in his website or in his Facebook, cheering Hamas, help, help, being happy that ISIS or, or Hamas or Al-Qaeda or the rest of the garbage is killing people, immediately I would target him as a terrorist. Those who actually murdered, immediately death penalty. Why should we feed them 30 years in prison with the five stars hotel? Immediately death penalty. Bury them inside the skin of a pig, and bury them somewhere in the middle of nowhere that no one will ever find them. They will never be returned to the family that should make a parade for them in Gaza. Shahid. Shahid in the bathroom. That's where he belongs. Everyone who just speak and happy about the act of those monsters, give him a warning that the next time will be also death penalty for him. If he will be caught one more time. But immediately take away citizenship, he cannot be in Israel, and throw him and his family out of Israel. Right away, within 24 hours. You have 24 hours, you pack your stuff, we're throwing you to Gaza. Live with your heroes. The, you know what they're going to do to him? These Israeli Arab from Haifa, from Jaffa, from Akko, that live like a king, drive a nice brand new Toyota, going to law school in Barilan. Some of them are lawyers with offices, building mansions in Galilee without work permit. They don't need permit. They don't need certificate of occupancy. They can build hotel 
anywhere they want. Nobody comes. Why? People are afraid of them. They do whatever they want. They do whatever they want. They have party. I saw one time a party of Arab Israelis. There were maybe 50 cars there. Lamborghini, Ferrari, Bentley. Mercedes was the cheapest car there. Party of rich Arabs in Galilee. In Beverly Hills, you don't have such life. Move them to Gaza for one week. See what's going to happen to them. This one who cheer for the Hamas in their Facebook page. One week they'll be there and they will find out what does it mean to live under their control. <laughs> they have life better than Switzerland. And what do they do? Stick the knife in the back of those who gave them this life, the Jews. Gave them parnassah, education, beautiful life. No one attacks them. There's no attacks against Arabs. There's no, Jews are not terrorists. You don't have, once in a blue moon, one retaliate when they murder Jews, he loses his mind and go and do something. It happened a few times. You can count on one end. With them, non-stop brainwash, non-stop propaganda against Jews. And they have the life. No, they speak in a mask in Israel, dead to the Jews. No one arrests them. No one arrests them. To me, they come to investigate me. To me, I'm the terrorist. They, whatever they want, they can say. Hopefully things are going to change now. Where do you find it in a parasha? We have 10 minutes left. Let me just conclude and you will know. Sarah is tough with Hagar. Sarah cannot have kids. She feels bad for Abraham. She said to him, look, I cannot give you a child. I don't have a wound. I don't have a rechem. Take uh, another woman. She may be able to give you kids. Who does he take? Hagar. Who is Hagar? A princess from Egypt. She came to be a servant of Abraham. She said, better to be a servant of this righteous man than to be a princess of a nation of wicked people. So she came to be a maid by Avraham, Agar. Avraham takes her right the way she conceived. Ishmael is born. Ishmael is born. Immediately, Agar starting to make fun at her master. Who is her master? Sarah. Sarah is the boss. She makes fun at Sarah. Why? She cannot have kids. I have kids. It hurts very much. Sarah got very angry at her. She comes to Abraham. What did she say? Listen to what she say. Hamasi Alecha. Hamas. Hamas. Hamasi Alecha. What's a Hamasi? Usually Hamas in the Torah, it's stealing. Abraham didn't steal anything. Sarah didn't steal. Nobody stole anything here. What does it mean Hamasi Alecha? There's no meaning. This is a hint from Hashem. The day Abraham took Agar, that's the end of us. The begin, beginning of our nightmare is right there. How much are we going to suffer because of that from these Arabs? The Ramban, not me, the Ramban, almost 800 years ago, one of the greatest rabbis in history. The Ramban say two things. One thing he say is, Sarah was strict with Agar and tortured her. Agar ran away. She couldn't take it. She ran away with Ishmael. Sarah said to Avraham, you cannot keep this wild beast in the house. It's going to destroy Yitzchak. That's later when Yitzchak was born. Throw him out of the house. Gave him water and bread and threw them out. They went now. The angel came to her. An angel. Where are you coming from and where are you heading to? Two questions the angel asked her. She said, I'm running away from my master, from my, from Sarah, from my boss. I'm running away from my giveret. And where is she going to? She didn't answer. Why? Because she doesn't know. First, she's thinking about running away from danger. Then she will worry where to go. 
What does the angel say to her? Return back to your master. Why? What do you think you came to the world for? You came to the world for two reasons. One is to be the policeman of my children, the Jews. Every time they do something wrong, I will send your monster children after them. And the second reason is you must be their servant. You will always be the servant of the Jews, no matter what you do, no matter how many billions you're going to have. You will always be in this world to serve the Jews. Two things happen here. One, you will be the servant of the Jews until the end of days. And at the same time, you will torture the Jews more than any other nation until the end of days. And now, the Gemara says, avot siman lebanim. What happened with our fathers usually will return to us. What happened to our fathers? Hagar was the servant of our father, Avraham and Sarah. The children of Hagar will be the servants of us forever. In all the Arab countries, there were never one Jewish maid in the house of a Muslim. Never. There were a lot of poor people. But a Jewish girl never worked as a maid, as a cleaning lady, as a servant in the house of any Arab ever in history. And all the Jewish wealthy people in the Middle East always had plenty of servants. All of them were Arabs. Never the other way around. All the buildings in Israel were all built by Arabs. All the cleaning services in Israel are all Arabs. All the painters and constructions in Israel are all Arabs. All the cleaning and hospital servants, these are all Arabs. Every dirty job you can think of in Israel is all Arabs. They all work for the Jews. Some of them have more money than the Jews, but they still serve the Jews. Some of them made fortune, but they always work for the Jews. Even those uh, Palestinians, hundreds of thousands of them come to Israel to work, to serve us. Every day, they open the gate, they have permit, they come, they come to work, they go back. Did you ever see a Jew go to work by them ever? Never. They always work for the Jews. But they also will also torture the Jews. The Ramban say, because uh, Sarah tortured Hagar, the children of Hagar will torture the children of Sarah until the end of days. Now you understand that politics will never help. The army will never help. United States will not help. No, United Nations for sure will not help. There is only one way to avoid the curse. Spiritual way. No physical way. The curse is physical curse. That's it. How do you overcome a physical curse? You're sick. What can save you? Only a miracle by Hashem. Miracle, you have to be tzaddik for miracles. Praying, learning Torah, giving your life for the Torah. Hashem is willing to do miracles for you, like he did for many great tzaddikim. Against the law of nature. But physically, that's it. The decree is made. There's nothing we can do about it. And also they got the blessing that they will multiply endlessly. Close to two billion. Yitzchak and them in Ishmael started at the same time. They have 1.8 billion. And how many we are? What, 15 million. What do you see? There's nowhere to run. They already occupied everywhere, the whole world. Besides China and uh, Japan that made sure not to let them in. In every country, they're already dominant. That's what it said. Ishmael pere adam. Yado bakol veyat kolbo. Ishmael is a wild beast. He will be involved in everything. Oil prices, terrorism, all the things you see. It's always them. There's nothing you can do about it. You get the point, Rabotai? Hafez Chaim say, there is no way to change the nature of Ishmael. 
You cannot civilize them. You cannot educate them. It doesn't matter. They'll be the most educated. They still have this desire to murder Jews. It's not even in their end. You see that the things that they do, it's not human. It's not human. Even the Nazis were so bad, so cruel, they would not agree to die or that their children will die to kill a Jew. But they, completely not rational. They're willing to sacrifice 20 Arabs to kill one Jewish child. It's unheard of. <laughs> you don't care about your life? Nothing. We are honored to die just to torture the Jews. Why? Because Hashem said so. And he also made sure that every time they come to murder us for our sins, they will always scream the name of God. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. It's not normal. I mean, there is a lot of religious going in the world, but they don't scream like crazy every two seconds. God is great, God is great. 500 times in a minute. The most righteous people in the history did not behave like this. It's all Hashem drives them crazy. He can work 20 years with you. You feed him, you give him clothes, you give him tips, you treat him like a king. He gets up and sticks the knife in your heart. Why? Because Hashem said so. Don't look for logic here. There is no negotiation, no agreement, no politics with them. That's it. It is what it is, and that's what it's going to be until the end of days. But the same way they did circumcision without Priya, because Ishmael was 13, their holding in the Holy Land is temporary until the Mashiach would come. When the Mashiach would come, you're going to see what end they're going to have. It will be sweeter than honey. But until then, we have to do everything we can to improve ourselves that we won't fall into the curse in our hand. Same thing, there's a curse on a human being that he has to work very hard in order for him to make a living. But there is a way to avoid the curse. If you, begin, you, be, you give your entire life for the Torah and the religion, you dedicate your life for the religion, what, what does Hashem do? Take away from you all the other problems in life. Kol am kabel al atzmo ol Torah, ma'avirim imeno ol eretz, ol derech eretz. Everyone who for sure say I'm a servant of the Torah, I give my life for the Torah. I don't care about luxury, materialism, I don't care about anything. I am your servant, but for real, I learn Torah until the last day of my life. Hashem find a lot of servants to help you out. This one supports you, this one, that one. All of a sudden, a girl, a father buy you an apartment. All kinds of unexpected things. But if you're a faker, you're going to have to work very hard. If you really been Torah, you don't have to ever worry about Parnassa. Never. It's all come to you on a gold ladder. But if you have no emuna and you're not serious in the Torah, you're going to have to kill yourself to make a living because the curse is on, on every human being. Even if you're a billionaire, you still have to work like a dog. Elon Musk and other billionaires, they work more than all of you. They go early in the office, they run, they fly, they meet people. They work harder than ordinary people. Yeah, they make billions. But they're still servants to their job. And there's a lot of stress also. And sometimes they start going one day $10 billion down. It's not easy. Why? You can avoid it if you become spiritually great. Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow I'm going to go into some more deeper stuff. And, and not tomorrow. Tomorrow there's no lecture in Brooklyn. I will speak in Brooklyn on Thursday. You can look in my calendar. Wednesday I'm speaking in Hebrew. Here in Queens. There's a lecture. A lot of Israelis are one, they wanted to speak about the situation. So it will be right here in Jamaica mistake. 